everyone. I'm Sarah Sterling, and I'm thrilled to be joined by this powerful team of Disney Imagineers and animators that made Disney's first ever Mickey and Friends ride through attraction, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Today we have joining us Sharita Carter, senior producer from Walt Disney Imagineering, Kevin Rafferty, retired executive creative director from Walt Disney Imagineering, Paul Rudish, executive producer and supervising director for The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse, Christopher Willis, composer for The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, and Elsa Chang, character designer for The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Thank you guys so much for being here with me today. I am so excited to speak with you about this. Thanks for having us. It's a great fun group. First, let's chat a bit about the Mickey Mouse shorts, which is what this attraction is based off of. Uh, the Mickey Mouse shorts are so classic and it's so exciting to see them come back to life on Disney Plus as the wonderful world of Mickey Mouse. Can you share a bit about the shorts now and how you've transitioned a classic into a more modern setting? Well, yes. Um, you know, when I uh, was first kind of developing the show, my, my favorite stuff was, you know, the old Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 20s and the 30s. And I always loved that rubber hose style and the, the, the pantomime acting and the broad physical comedy and slapstick. Being modern people, this is going to have a modern flair to it. But the humor from the old cartoons really resonates with, you know, with so many people and definitely with all the folks on our crew. And so it's just very became a very natural kind of feel where we could kind of, again, look back at the old cartoons and gain inspiration, yet come up with new kinds of jokes that feel more relevant for today's audiences, yet not, uh, not dated. You know, we, we still try to keep things like a very relatable and broad kind of ideas that, that people still relate to from different ages. And um, and it looks like maybe we've been sort of successful with that. Paul, I remember uh, you saying that um, there are things that people think are uh, are new in the new shorts and you have to politely rem uh, correct them to that they're actually not. Like, for instance, the characters all talking in a, in a language other than English with no subtitles. Um, that, that, that I was just blown away by that and thought that was completely kind of a crazy innovation. Um, but then you, suddenly you discover that they did that in- uh... They have done that before, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Mickey has already established in his, you know, since his beginnings that he can go anywhere, be any, any kind of job, any kind of setting, any kind of situation. If different countries all around the world, you know, Mickey doesn't live in one little suburban town with rules about how all of his friends and, and uh, things work. But the thing that is consistent about Mickey and the cast is their character and their character dynamics and how they, they play off of each other and like the emotional roles that they fill. And so again, that's, that's kind of the home for Mickey and the Fab Five. And, uh, and again, that allows him to be really flexible and go anywhere and do anything. And it's, it's a very refreshing bunch of characters. It gives you a lot of leeway to do lots of stuff with. And like Chris, what you're saying is a lot of times think people think we've done stuff really new, but if you look back at the old cartoons, you know, Walt already made the precedent that Mickey's free to do anything you want to do with him. So yeah, it's really fun property to play with and a great bunch of characters to to be friends with <laughs> <laughs> and so when as a team did you guys find out about the idea of turning these shorts into a full-blown ride through attraction at walt disney world and how did how exciting was that or scary or all the feelings <laughs> i don't remember the exact date you know it's been several years because it takes a minute to develop a ride. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> but, um, uh, definitely when we were first contacted about getting involved in it, it was really exciting. Uh, I've always said that I always wanted to grow up to be Mark Davis <laughs> someday and uh, you know, make that transition from animation and into you know, doing stuff with theme parks and Again, that transition from 2D to a, a 3D kind of show is always something that would be really intriguing for me. And then when this this opportunity came up, it was it was a dream come true. And 
you know, and then meeting Sharita and Kevin and all the teams that, you know, that were involved over there was just, it was a treat. You know, we'd, we'd come over for brainstorming meetings once or twice a week and, and bring some of the folks from our crew and meet all the folks from Imagineering and then just start coming up with crazy ideas. And, and, you know, as they say it over at Imagineering, it was blue sky and it was just, what kind of crazy ideas does everybody have to throw them out onto the table and let's see what eventually can actually get built and become, you know, actually practical. But yeah, it was fantastic to, to get involved with, with a project like this. Sarah, if I may, I was going to say, uh, and Sharita can tell you this, that I, I said, you know what, Sharita, the only way we're going to do this is to get Paul and Chris on board uh, because, you know, because they are kind of the heart and soul of the shorts, obviously. And not to mention, I was a big, you know, Paul Rudish fan anyway. So uh, she can tell you that I was, you know, extremely nervous about them saying no for whatever reason. You know, we're too busy. We don't want to get involved or something. So I can't tell you how excited I was when Paul was excited about it and Chris was excited about it. And so, um, you know, and the rest is history, but uh, I, I've been with Imagineering for a long time and it was just the working relationship between TV animation and Paul and his team. And of course, Chris and our team at Imagineering, it was just amazing. It was so much fun. Right, and Kevin, you know, you would often say that, you know, our goal in bringing this amazing um, animated, these, an these amazing animated shorts into a dimensional experience is it needed to feel like a short, it needed to sound like a short, it needed to look like a short. So, you know, partnering with the, you know, the people who have brought this forth was just, it was paramount to, uh, to what we were doing at Imagineering. It was, um, it was so funny for us because, because that one of the, one of the big, um, projects of the of the mickey shorts was to um was to sort of inhabit and um kind of move through all of the sort of disney the layers of disney prehistory you know we were, we were sort of sort of having fun with the old cartoon characters and having fun with the old movies but also having fun with old rides and really really getting having a lot of fun talking about the history of of the parks and learning about rides that, that don't even exist anymore, um, putting things in the shorts that, um, that are really quite arcane. Um, so it was, it was, it was, um, it was so wild to then suddenly, uh, Paul, I remember I, I used to come down to your office um, after the meetings and just sort of, sort of natter about what was coming down the pipes and see, see what you've been sketching and just sort of talk talk in a more informal way after we had our music meetings um and one of the strange things is that imagineering and tva are really close to each other geographically so <laughs> so he might have actually literally come in from a meeting by walking down the street and said you never guess where i was just 10 minutes ago i was at imagineering which is just there and i would have had no idea we'd spent five years at that point obsessing over the you know things like adventure through in a space and um uh, you know the old song properties and the carousel of progress and all these the, the and 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 the 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 more detailed the information about the old rides the more fun we found it and the more exciting it was to, to put it in so to then actually go from there to to making one was such a was a sort of a natural step you know the, the only thing more geeky than what we'd already been doing would be to actually make one <laughs> yeah uh, you know what, Chris? It was what was so great is to find out that both you and Paul and the whole team at TVA, they're all you were all Disney Park fans, and you knew a lot about the parks, and you and you knew a lot about the history of the parks, and and now you were making history for the parks, and so the fact that you guys were excited about that and theme park fans just made it a joy. It made the moons come into alignment so perfect for this attraction. It was just so it was just so great. For sure, like you're saying, I've I've been a armchair parks historian for a while. <laughs> and I've always been a fan of the parks, and then starting at Disney was really great that we were all on that same kind of campus, and we'd go over and eat lunch at Imagineering and go peek around corners and stuff and go, Ooh, "What's going on? Are they? What are they making? All the top secret stuff? Oh, we can't get to see that." Or you know, go to the the library, the research library they have, and they have all like uh, 
all the old development art for the parks and the rides uh, on uh, uh, archive there. And so it's a great resource to just be able to go in and, and again, look at all the, the history of the parks and actually see the original artwork that was done by, you know, all those amazing artists. And um, so again, when this opportunity came around, like I said, it was a dream come true. And, and also just really refreshing to hear, it's like, well, you know, the, most of the original attractions were actually designed by many of the art directors of the films that they were based on, you know, and, and uh, there was that, that crossover from the original Disney artists then moved on into the Imagineering space. And um, so I was just like, this is brilliant. This is like, you, you're actually gonna ask us to be a part of it. And again, just really flattering and amazing. It's like, oh, oh my gosh, is it, uh, do we get to relive the old days? That's kind of great. <laughs> That's a good point. And it was true musically too, that you would find the same, you know, uh, uh, George Bruins and Buddy Baker and a lot of, the, a lot of the, the people that were central to the sound of the animated films and the live action films uh, were moving backwards and forwards between between the films and um, things for the parks, um, uh, which is not necessarily something that that happens all the time now, but just feels very, you know, it feels very natural. Um, yeah, very exciting. And now, Chris, you're, you're very much a part of that, as, as Sharita said earlier. I mean, it had to it had to look like a Mickey Mouse short and it had to sound like a Mickey Mouse short. And, you know, you're you know, you're all about creating the sound for the shorts. And, uh, and I think that's where the attraction is really successful is because it delivers on that sound and that music and that original composition that you, that you bring to the table, you know, for the shorts that you brought to uh, our attraction as well. So um, now you've created a sound that will, you know, live for, for many, many years, just like George Brenz and Buddy Baker and all those guys did for the parks. You're part of that team now, you know? There was a great enthusiasm on the on the part of the all the musicians that we'd worked with for many years on the shorts because um, uh, because the shorts are so compact that um, from a musical point of view from the, for the performers um, there's a feeling that there's sort of ah oh, we have more to give you know it was it was it was great doing that kind of wild thirty second burst of bebop or 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 jazz or, uh, uh, or, or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, kind of corn gold. Uh, but we could do more, you know, we could always do more. So, and we were really getting together the same team of musicians that we had had on the shorts when we came to do, to the, do the ride and do the cue line music, which is this big, big loop of, of, uh, of music based on the shorts. There was this sort of hunger on the part of all these great uh, session, session musicians. Uh, with the, we had a, a, the choir, for the ride was all singers that had worked previously on the shorts and on the shorts we tended to work with them in these small groups you know just two or three or four singers um and we were like you know if we if we work entirely with people that that know the shorts then then everyone will get the idea but actually that was the first time that all those people had ever been in the room on a mickey mouse project together i mean they a lot of them know each other because this is a, a session singing world but you had this this great group of of all-star people who were finally um coming together so it was it, it was a great sort of logic to it chris i want to i want to pat you on the back for a second and say what people need to understand is how difficult and challenging it is to create a music score for an attraction i mean it's different for the screen when you, you know, you cut or smash cut or you, you cut to a different scene or something like that. In an attraction, you have maybe one or two or three scenes that can be seen and heard at the same time. And it kind of has to seamlessly blend and all work together. And part of the fun of developing the attraction was watching Chris kind of switch gears from his flat screen world and, and sensibility there and, and talent and interpret that into a three dimensional realm. And, uh, and so it was so funny as, as we had um, many of our people kind of explaining the math and the, 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 the placement of vehicles, you know, as they traverse through the scenes and everything to Chris, he was very thoughtful about it. I, I, I always used to love watching his eyes kind of go up in the air a little bit and then he'd get it and he would go, right. And then you could see the light bulb go <laughs> off and then he would design to that. And it was very, very difficult to do. 
Right. And Kevin, if I could just add to that, I think Chris's curiosity um, as to our process was really, really key. And uh, we would often say after a session, boy, he is such a quick study, <laughs> you know, because we would introduce something that was supposedly completely foreign to how he's operated. But by the end of the session, uh, he would he would have it. So it was it was always delightful. Well, we had great, great people to explain these things like uh, like Joe Harrington, we should definitely talk about, who's been doing sound and audio uh, uh, and music for the rides for such a long time. Um, and uh, was was, you know, no, no technical challenge really uh, would would he was unflappable, you know, um, he was always prepared to explain how it worked and um, is really the soul of 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 Disney, the sound of of Disney parks. Um, I'm sure we'll talk more about him when we talk about contraptions and sound effects and things. Yeah, like that. you're right, Chris. I mean, Joe Joe is what what Jimmy McDonald was for the studio for all those years and creating sound effects. Joe Harrington is that sound effects wizard for Imagineering, and and you couldn't have learned from a better source. You're right. So Paul was mentioning the kind of zany pace of the Mickey Mouse shorts. How do you think Imagineering was able to capture the crazy pace of the storylines in an attraction? Well, the ride itself is a little bit fast paced and there's just so much to look at. Um, you know, each, each section of the attraction, there's just a lot of animation. Um, you know, it's there's a lot of squashing and stretching in the shorts, which also the animators have in, have done a lot of for the attraction itself. And um, it's it's hard to just kind of keep your eyes on one thing when there's so much going around. So the ride itself is pretty zany, just as much as the animation is. Definitely. And as a character designer. These are some of the most beloved characters in all of animation history. How is it for you to work to bring these characters to life in modern day? Um, yeah, I've always been a, a Disney fan ever since I was very little. So it's it's always been a dream of mine to work for Disney. So it's a dream come true and uh, to be able to touch such uh, classic characters is definitely, you know, on, on a bucket list of things to do. So I definitely feel so, so lucky and grateful to, to have the opportunity. Um, yeah, I, growing up, I watched so much animation and, uh, you know, to, to be a part of the industry and, and work on such fun characters is definitely, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy every moment of it. I have a question on that. If if um the the in the ride itself, the the characters are huge, right? I mean, so I, I suppose the resolution on the screen for the shorts themselves is 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 big, but literally you might look over and see a character that's sort of uh, uh six feet tall in the ride. Um, is it different? Do you, do you do anything differently in terms of posing or thinking about what you're going to be, how, what the experience is like if they're huge like that? Uh, for me, for my process, no. Um, you know, I I worked on uh, specifically one character, and you know, he's he's very he's very small. So uh, you know, it's the scale for me it really doesn't change all that much. You know, just draw on a high resolution file, and um, they the animators can use it and. Um, yeah, so long as, you know, draw clearly, uh, and they can probably blow it up as, as big as they need to. Oh, wow. Kevin had mentioned scale before, <clears throat> and that was a discussion we had to have while we were planning things, you know, like Mickey can only be so big, like he can't get bigger than, you know, we had a, we actually had like a cardboard cutout on the set yeah, for scale. Right. and like Mickey is three and a half feet tall. So if he's going to be this far away from the audience, he has to be this size and a, a lot of considerations for, you know, making sure the characters don't get too big and then, and then don't feel lifelike versus, you know, getting too small and looking too high. Like we'd always have to like check eye lines. Like we'd have a little wooden bench or something during some of the mock-ups and you'd like, this is the height of the vehicle. And so sitting here, our eye line goes this way and 
oops, you know what? Maybe that facade, that piece of the, the set piece is too high. Now that we're sitting down, it's obscuring the angle of the, of the projection. And so there's a lot of, lots of technical things like that, like trying to translate, yeah. you know, yeah. your, your two dimensional thinking. And then once you get it into a three dimensional space, there's different considerations. It's like, and, I, I, when I was saying a lot during it, your kid brain knows what it should be like. You know, she should just be in the cartoon. And it was the same with the music too. Your kid brain knows that when you go from, you know, you're underwater and you, and you come out and you see this huge jazz band underwater, you kind of know what that should sound like, but, but then your grown up brain has to figure out, okay, are we going to have speakers hidden behind all the, all the instruments? And are we going to, you know, what are we going to do with the speakers on the ceiling? And, and, uh, and, you, <laughs> and, and you know, some of our scenes, I mean, in that scene in particular, some of our scenes are so epic. They're so huge that we couldn't find mock-up space big enough to actually recreate the scale of an entire scene. And so Paul, as you were talking about when we had the meetings to determine scale of the characters, I remember on many occasions that we were actually laying on our backs in the, on the floor because we could <laughs> only realize the upper half of a scene. But yeah. you know, what, what people need to understand is that the scale of a character is so important, especially when you're in a moving vehicle. And, and in this case, the vehicles could be in different places at different times because you know they, they can do that. And so the character scale and believability has to hold up no matter where you are. And so I also remember that we uh, had like little four wheel chairs that we we wheel everybody in around like they were the ride vehicle to make sure that, <laughs> and Chris said it too, it's just like in your little kid brain, it's got to be believable. That's got to be the Mickey you know from the short. Um, and and it's it's interesting when you when you stage something in a scene, how that scale has to change relative to where your sightline is. Right. All the relationships have to stay intact at all times. Yeah. And lots of definitely interesting considerations translating again from 2D animation to 3D space is like creatively the thinking is all. It's the same. We're all telling stories and, and, and drawing drawings and stuff. But then, well, animation is a very technical process and we have lots of rules and, and techniques and bells and whistles that, you know, we have to abide by. But then there's this whole new set bringing it to uh, the, the 3D space. For instance, you know, again, in 2D animation, we're just drawing in our little aspect ratio. But now we've got set pieces that are 360 degrees around us with projections all around and it's populated by multiple characters. And so having to like plan out those scenes, getting the layouts from uh, Imagineering and then exploding those out and going, okay, so actually our space is this long and we need one character to enter from this side and another character to enter from this side. And we can't possibly draw all that in one file. So trying to figure out considerations on how to uh, animate one character separately, another character separately, but then working out all the timing so that when those characters travel and they meet at one end of the room, that the timing is all worked out. So there's lots of extra math, but uh, our editors and our storyboard people and our animators, uh, finally, you know, it all clicked. And, you know, especially from all the amazing uh, technical breakdowns that we received from WDI. We had si situations where we would be given like CG 3D model mock-ups of something moving through space and we'd have to animate a character that lives on that moving element. And then, okay, so it's all broken down in the timing and we can track the viewer's eye line is going to be here, but the neck, but that vehicle is going to be moving this way. And so because of that, will the characters stay within the eye line of the viewer? And so making considerations for that, we could like track frame by frame how that vehicle was moving. And then we could animate to that and then have our character make sure that like leans out in one direction so that that corner isn't obscuring it. And like, <laughs> yeah. you know, make the acting fit within the actual physical movement of, oh, of wow. what's happening in the ride. So very technical but fun challenges and and it looks really cool when you ride <laughs> you know all one of the things that that's really amazing that you were able to do is 
you know, from, from the world you came from, you put the backgrounds and the characters all kind of existing together on, on the flat plane of the screen. And in the attraction, as you were saying this, I was thinking about all the, the many times where, you know, we, we build dimensional physical show sets, theatrical show sets. There's a lot of showmanship involved with the staging and the lighting and the, the physical practicalities of that. And then you were able to work within the limitations, if you will, of those physical show sets. And in some scenes where they were needed, put the characters uh, in that scene where it was totally seamless, uh, where the, 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 the projected characters or the realization of a character in another way would appear at the same time with a dimensional theatrical scenic set. It was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, that blend is really fascinating when you when you see it all live and you're riding the ride and you mm -hmm. can't see the seams. It's, you don't know where 3D ends and 2D begins and go ride it, gang. It's fun. Right. It's part of that, <laughs> it's part of that unique integration that we were talking about where we were taking all these different techniques and putting them together in a really fresh way. And like I said, the the animated short really lent itself to being able to do that and 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 it was a lot of fun. I still don't know how you did that. When you when I first went to see a mock up and um and this and the projectors were switched off and I realized which bits are painted and which bits are projected because suddenly they all just look white. I was like, no way. <laughs> because with the projector on, you had absolutely no idea. Just the whole thing just looks like a huge cartoon and you can't tell what's what's being done one way and what's being done another way. Right, and there's certain compositions that work better than others. And that was kind of the point of the mock-ups to really dial in and uh, get those blend lines so that it was really believable. So the guests would never know what was, what was dimensional, what was physically there, what was painted or what was printed. And, and our scenic painters were absolutely masters at being oh, able yeah. to physically paint what looked like a flat cartoon uh, world in, in your shorts. I mean, they were able to match your style, but in dimension so beautifully. Um, and, you know, we, we also had to, several scenes worked in a, in a white light configuration and several scenes worked in a UV light configuration. And, and the locomotive, for example, um, we had to design color wise and otherwise to, to work in both lighting conditions and still hold up and maintain the integrity that it was a cartoon locomotive. Uh, with all the drawn lines and and um it just it just it was it was uh kind of miraculous the way it all worked out <laughs> but everybody loves a challenge and this this particular project just provided so many different challenges and everybody was stretched and that's what made it so um, satisfying um, that it turned out the way it did well, it's really cool to hear how, you know, the differences between composing music for a cartoon versus an attraction. But similarly, while this attraction is based off of the Mickey Mouse shorts, it's also an original cartoon itself. So how did you guys work together to make sure it matched, you know, the look of the cartoons and was authentic for, for the attraction itself? Well, that was that was key, Sarah, is, is that, you know, I mean, part of the challenge, and Sharita can talk talk this uh, in a little bit, but but part of the challenge was to make sure I mean, the premise of the attraction is you get to step through the screen, you get to step inside and ride through a Mickey Mouse cartoon short. So it absolutely had to look and feel like that. And, um, and we had to do a lot of interpretation between the flat, uh, you know, the off register look in the backgrounds and, and the character design and everything, and bring that into the dimensional world. And so, um, you know, Paul said it earlier, was, I, I love what he said about how a lot of the art, you know, the art directors and the, the animators were brought over to kind of reinterpret their skill to design attractions for the Disney parks when Disneyland was being designed and developed. And, and Paul kind of follows suit in that where he got to come with his team from, from TV animation and reinterpret what they do best on the flat screen and work with us to kind of, for lack of better words, kind of extrapolate that flatness, the flat characters and the flat backgrounds into that world. So. Um, it was just, it was really a fun process. And, and most of all, it had to be a very believable experience. Once you step through that screen, you, in, in the attraction, you need to feel like you stepped into that, that Mickey Mouse cartoon short. And so it actually took both teams, Imagineering and TV animation to kind of pull off that miracle, if you will. 
Right, you're absolutely right, Kevin. It was this complete uh, partnership with, uh, with TBA bringing to the table what they do best and then we as Imagineers bring to the table what we do best. And, you know, Paul mentioned it earlier with Mickey, he, you know, he could do anything and really doesn't have any limits. So one of our biggest challenges was to take what we refer to as the cartoon physics that are so prevalent in the shorts and bring them into a dimensional world where there are, are actually physics that we had to adhere to. And um, it was this great design challenge for us as Imagineers. Um, it was an experience, I can speak for Kevin, that we'll, we'll never forget because um, it was just a, a unique opportunity to take that 2D world and immerse our guests completely so that they felt like they had entered into a short. You know what, Sharita, as you were saying that, what I was thinking about is, is you know, in a world where there are no rules, really, in the right. animated world, we had to follow follow rules. In other words, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the art direction, in, in the attraction itself, you know, if somebody were to say, hey, let's, let's do this over here, and I would always remind the team, well, would it look that way in the short? Would, would it appear, would it look hand-drawn? We have to follow the rules that Paul and his team established in the short. And, and just a, a quick little sidebar story, when some of our engineers were designing the locomotive vehicle for the ride itself, um, they had kind of physical fasteners like nuts and bolts and things like that on there. And I always remember, you know, to go back to the rules of the short and say, you know, yeah, these are really great in design wise. It looks great and it would be okay for Big Thunder or some other kind of physical, you know, outdoor attraction, but it needs to look like it's hand drawn. And so once everybody kind of learned the rules of the game, then the engineers and the designers were able to not put physical fasteners on this thing, but to hide the fasteners like the nuts and the bolts and then we drew them on. So it looked like, even though it was a dimensional piece, uh, it looked like it was all hand drawn. And that was part of adapting to and sticking to the rules. Right, Kevin, you're, you're exactly right. There were exact rules. And I think part of our success was that we were able to immerse all of our designers uh, in those rules. And so by the, the end of the attraction, it's like everybody knew what was, what was right and you know, what was rep very representative of the shorts because uh, we made it a big point to make sure that we stuck to them. We established our true north and we did not deviate from it. Yeah, another good example of that is like the brass bell and the locomotive itself. It, it, you know, originally they wanted to design it to be a brass bell and I said, it can't be shiny. It can't look like a real bell. We have to paint that thing to look like it fits into Mickey's world in the short, so. I have a question about that. Uh, one thing I particularly admire is the way that the, um, the pencil strokes, if you were, the lines say on the, on the, on the cactuses in the, uh, in the stampede, the, the pencil strokes aren't necessarily aligned with the washes of color, which uh, which in in this world means that I think they're actually like at different levels, aren't they? Um, so yeah. that as you move as you move, you don't really realize at first, but as you move past them, they kind of refuse to sit quite aligned with each other. Do Do you remember how that came about? That I I would never have thought of doing that, well, but that is. But when you think about it, that is very much in keeping with the shorts because in the shorts they don't they often don't quite line up with each other. Yeah, and, and when I said we kept up with the rules of what you guys created for the flat screen, that, that's not to say it was very easy. I mean, I, I, I'm a huge fan of that, you know, off register, color block off register look where, you know, the, the buildings, for example, are, you know, blocks of color and the, the, the lines that define the buildings are just a little bit off and they're and on the on the flat screen in a drawing, they're kind of floating away from the color. Well, how do you do that in a dimensional world? So to answer your question, Chris, we, we spent many, many, many hours um, trying <laughs> to figure out how to make the cactus, like you said, appear like it was off register, even though it was a physical dimensional thing. And what's really cool is if you go into the, the Western scene and you pay attention to those cactus and they are dimensional, when you first see them, they first establish themselves as a very flat off register sketch. But as you, as your vehicle kind of traverses by them, you can see the dimensionality start to happen. And in a way that, that, that movement, that kind of parallax, that dimensionality serves us well in bringing that flat world into the world of dimension. So we did a lot of experimentation. We did 
I'm sure Rita can tell you about all the millions of mock-ups we did. Yeah, I was gonna say mock-ups were key and just giving right. um, different things a, you know, a try. And Chris, I can really say this idea of establishing this design language was something that was so exciting for our product production designers and our set designers. Um, and like I said, we did quite a bit of experimentation, but when we when we got it right, we knew we had nailed it. And it was just really this unique opportunity from a design perspective, which made it so exciting. And, you know, I want to say to add to that is to keep us honest, to make sure we were doing the right thing, to make sure we were maintaining the integrity of the art direction and look of the shorts. Most of the time, you know, when they were major mock-ups, we always made sure that Paul was over to kind of, you know, give his blessing and to check, check it out. And Paul would always have a note or two um, in, in the look of that. So that, that <laughs> Paul's uh, presence was, was always something that was great and that we loved because it really kept us honest to the world. Well, I pretty much just came over and just went, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, then that was approval. <laughs> See, Paul, we, we live to have that reaction from you. It's like, what can we do today to make Paul say, wow. <laughs> right. Sharita and I would walk back down the street from the mock-up and go, Paul loved it. He loved it. <laughs> it's really interesting to hear how much, um, you know, the dimension goes into doing the backgrounds and you kind of had to like match um physical 3d stuff to what you see on the 2d shorts whereas i work with characters uh it's very much 2d and not much is different from the process from what i do for the shorts versus uh what i had to work on for the ride um it was just a lot of taking uh, existing characters and posing them and drawing them on model and making sure that um it's you give the animators something to work off of that is very tied down. And um, yeah, like I, I only got to work on a very small part of uh, this project. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of other great designers that were collaborating with all together. So I, I felt very lucky to be able to touch a little bit um, part of the ride and design a fun little background character named Chuby. Um, and he does little little dances in the beginning and the end of the, the ride. And to be able to like uh, see that, it, it's just so small and you really have to pay attention to it to be able to find it. But to see it, it just really made my day. Um, but yeah, it's it, my process as a designer was very similar. Um, yeah, can't speak for the animators or the location designers, but it's, it's really interesting to hear. Well, Elsa, just so you know, I am the president of the Chuby Fan Club, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I so stickers cute. and everything. <laughs> oh yeah, I have the plushie. I love him so much. I feel like Chuby. Chuby yeah, is... blew up like that, and everybody fell in love with Chuby. And then towards the end of the ride, we we're like, oh, the end. Kevin was like, we got this one little section right at the end near the exit. We need more Chuby. Let's put him back in there. And so we came back around and did another little scene of some Chuby antics over the exit. And uh, he got a lot more play than anyone expected. And he's again, amazing. like Elsa said, he's got plushies and socks. <laughs> he sort of emerged totally <laughs> All organic. kinds of accessories, purses. <laughs> <laughs> who, who first drew Chuby? Wait, wait. Was it Elsa or was it Alonso who first drew? Uh, Alonso boarded it, so yeah, I believe, yeah. I was, I was kind of thinking of um, Mary Poppins, I guess. You know that that the the bit where she does the duet with the uh, with the Robin. Is it a Robin? Robins? Yeah, so, yeah, that amazing animatronic Robin. I don't know how they did that. Um, you know, the great thing about Chuby as well is, you know, not, not only is he a breakout star, but because. <laughs> You know, this this attraction features an original story. It's an all original uh, attraction that that Chuby also helps to enforce the originality of the attraction. He's a brand new original character specific to the attraction. And uh, and that really, you know, helped to give that the originality of the attraction even more credibility, if you will. Well, Elsa, you don't have to make any promises, but do you think we'll see Chuby more in the future in any upcoming shorts or anywhere else? Uh, that's not up to me. <laughs> it's more <laughs> so up to the directors. If they want to add them in, uh, I'll be happy to draw them if uh, they decide to. <laughs> Clearly, there's a demand. So the if world needs more Chuby. <laughs> if, if you need some nudging from Sharita, she'd be happy to help. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, Kevin and Sharita, this is Disney history because this is the first ever Mickey and Fr- Minnie and Friends attraction at the Disney parks. So why do you think it took so long for Mickey and Minnie to get their own attraction? Well, you know, I, I kind of have a personal philosophy about that. I've, I've been with Imagineering for, I don't know, almost almost 43 years. And, and in all that time, there have been different ideas for attractions uh, featuring Mickey, but but none of them really stuck. And, and, and my philosophy about that is, is that, Paul said it earlier, actually, very well, is, you know, Mickey and Minnie have, have done everything. They, they've lived in a lot of different places. They've been, they've been to a lot of different places. And, and to kind of continue on that thought, they don't really have jobs, you know. So, for example, if you, at jobs that, that you know, in fact, it just is a little sidebar story, too. I, I helped develop a Toy Story Midway Mania, um, the ride through game attraction. And the original concept for that was Mickey's Midway Mania. But, but Mickey mm-hmm. was too big. He was too important to be given the role of a, a carnival, you know, game guy. And so, um, so it, it, the ideas for Mickey attraction have been tossed around for, for, for many years. And what really brought it home, I think, is that first of all, we wanted to give Mickey a place in the heart of the park. And when we knew that we wanted to update or change the great movie ride in the Chinese theater, Disney's Hollywood Studios, there was a heart of the park place right there, right, right at the end of Hollywood Boulevard, that iconic building. And we thought, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if, if Mickey were to have some kind of a presentation there? What if we had a, a, a premiere of a Mickey movie, a Mickey short, where, you, where something, you know, terribly went wrong and you could step through the screen and step inside. And that's kind of how it all started. But it was hard to create an original story because, uh, you know, uh, if, if you think about Mater and Lightning, they come from Radiator Springs. They have jobs. Mater's a race car and Lightning's a tow truck. You can, you can develop a story about that. You know where they live. You have, you have a place for that. And, you know, Anna and Elsa, um, you know, live in Arendelle and you know what their roles are. And, and you, could, you could have a place for that. Uh, in fact, you know, we did at Epcot with Frozen Ever After. What do you do? What the heck do you do with Mickey and Minnie, who are, you know, the most iconic characters? They've been everywhere and done everything. And I think uh, that's, that's a long-winded way of saying what really inspired the idea for the attraction is two things. One is, of course, you know, Paul, Paul and his group and TVA and that um, the work that they did on the Mickey shorts gave us that comedy and that color and that cadence and that edginess. And I mean, those things are just laugh out loud funny. And I was a huge fan. In fact, when we started thinking about the idea for this, uh, Sharita can tell you, I had on my back wall, I had still frames from every single cartoon short that Paul and his group had made. And I became like this expert of every frame. I knew every, every one of them, every line, everything, and fell in love with, with Chris's music. Um, and so it, it, it helped to inspire, even though Mickey and Minnie have been everywhere and done everything, it helped to inspire that, that kind of feel, right? The off-register art direction. Everything about the shorts was perfect for an attraction. Part two of that was um, our wonderful Sharita Carter and her brilliance has been leading a group for about a decade on on new ways to present dimensional shows and uh, experiences with with scenic illusions and with the ability to do a lot more with dimension than technology ever allowed us to do it before. And so the fact that Sharita and her team were able to come up with a, 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 a technology that would allow you to believe that you could step into a cartoon and then having Paul and his group with that cartoon and with that world and with those characters and with that look, it was just a perfect match. It was just, it was time to uh, create Mickey and Minnie's first ever ride through attraction. And those were the things that truly inspired it. And, and it was an original story. It was an original story for an attraction for the park, which, which I always promised my old boss, Marty Sklar, who was our fearless leader at Imagineering for many years, um, he'd always say, hey, Kev, you have that original attraction idea yet? You know, kind of thing. And so that, that was always poking at the back of me is, you know, we need an attraction as, as great as the IP attractions are, like, you know, Radio Springs Racers and Frozen Ever After and things like that. We also need to continue to develop brand new stories. And that, in a nutshell, that's kind of how that all came about. Yeah, and we as, as Imagineers, you know, just really love that opportunity to participate with an original story. And as Kevin mentioned, I had been working in a lab environment, working with just some absolute geniuses over a number of years, um, where we would develop techniques and tools that would 
give our, our storytellers more to work with. And just the whole style of the short really kind of lent itself to us being able to showcase a number of the different things that we had been working on. And it was this idea of taking, in some cases, technology that existed or technology that we had used in a certain way, but using it in a unique way and integrating it together in a way to produce an immersive uh, environment that really made the guests feel like they were um, experiencing and walking through and traveling through the short. So it was just an absolute delight. Um, I even dare say perhaps even a kind of a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> it was just very, very, very cool. Yeah, I want to tack on just again, coming over for brainstorming meetings and working with all the mad scientists on your crew. <laughs> it's so amazing. You know, we just like throw out stupid ideas and then somebody would go, hmm, you know what? I think if we like could wrap a piece of semi-translucent foil and put a projector behind that and do this, and then we could rig a thing up this way, and you know, <laughs> we might be able to actually pull off the stupidest idea you've come up with. And you know, <laughs> like to have all this ridiculous fantasy, like actually like given this thoughtful, you know, like I said, scientific actual thought. You know, nobody said, oh, that's a silly idea. We can't ever do that. Everyone was like, Hmm, I think I can invent a supercomputer that can do that. <laughs> like, wow, okay. One thing I loved about the this this the source the story that um the imagineering came up with, um, from my point of view, coming in uh, uh, with all these all this kind of enthusiasm about the history of rides, it's just how how resonant the the shape of it was going to be. You know, the train. The, the the train ride that 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 runs amok just sort of reminds you of all these other trains in the parks and of course Walt had his own train um, you've got Casey Jr. we'd done to one of our first shorts was about a train um, and having the song in the short um, sets you up for a shape that is absolutely classic that's that that says okay that the, the the music in the ride is going to be is going to be constructed around a completely new song and that in my brain takes you all the way back to um things like it's a small world and um and the pirates ride and the haunted mansion ride all these rides that are constructed musically around songs so from my composer point of view i was like wow this is just so um this is again is a once in a lifetime opportunity. This is this this all the all the all the ingredients are here to make something that 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 is very much like an old a first generation uh, Disneyland ride um, with this sort of high concept ideas about about musical. And Chris, you nailed it. You nailed it because you know people. The, the joke was everybody walking around Disneyland and singing "It's a Small World," and you know think about what the attractions would be like without the theme songs, "Grim Grinning Ghosts," and. Yo ho, yo ho, and all that. These these are songs that just stick in people's heads. And I remember you asking me, you know, what do you think the song needs to be, or or something like that. And I said it, it needs people need to walk around in the park and be, and it's stuck in their head. They can't get it out of their head. And Sharita mm -hmm. and I, I can't tell you how many times we walked from the building after we opened back to our office backstage and heard people singing that song. <laughs> and <laughs> many of them saying, oh, I can't get it out of my head. And so, you know, you, you did it, man. You, you, you just nailed it. That's excellent. It's uh, definitely an earworm for sure. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited to hear each of your individual um, responses to this, but I know that this attraction has a lot of hidden gems and nods to Disney history within it. So I'd love to hear about a few of them, maybe your personal favorites. <laughs> if I may, I kind of have two, two, uh, two of them. Um, my, my favorite one is kind of a story that's related to that. In our, in our downtown scene, um, when Leslie Iwerks, who directed the Imagineering documentary, uh, came down and um, Leslie's a friend and and so Sharita and I wanted to walk her through we were we were still a long way away from opening the attraction so we all had to put our hard hats on and and PPE and all that and Leslie was walking through and she was just joking with me and she said so you have a few hidden Mickeys do you do you also have a hidden iWorks and she could not have asked that question she was just joking but she could not have asked that question in a more perfect time because we were stepping into the big city scene and we do have a building in the big city that's called iWorks and UWorks Waterworks. And so I said, Leslie, as a matter of fact, we do. 
turn around. <laughs> and it just blew her away. She almost dropped down to her knees. I mean, you could not have timed that more perfectly. But but I have to say my, my favorite little hidden gem is um, there's a lot of kind of nods to not only Mickey and his history and Walt, um, but also to people who are very involved with, with bringing Mickey to life over the years. And one of them I mentioned earlier was Jimmy McDonald, who was not only a sound effects wizard, but, but the voice of Mickey himself for, for 38 years. And, um, and Jimmy had among his stash of, of original sound effects equipment, uh, lots of contraptions and things that he actually built uh, himself in his garage that were used for different shorts and, and um, animated features through the years that we, we brought to life in our attraction. We did it old school. I mean, today you can kind of go and you can get digital files and you can find sound effects and, and things like that. But we, uh, uh, we actually, and Chris mentioned Joe Harrington earlier, we had Joe come in and we brought some of those original um, Jimmy McDonald contraptions that were used over the years of many different animated projects to life in the attraction. My favorite one is that among Jimmy's stash, he had the original tritone whistle that was the whistle in Steamboat Willie. So another nod, nod hearkening back to the history of Mickey, when Mickey pulls the rope on, on his steamboat and the whistle blows, we have that physical whistle, Joe Harrington has it. And so we use that whistle sound um, as the sound of a locomotive whistle in the attraction. So it will live forever in that attraction. And it's so amazing because in the final scene, uh, Chris and, and, and Joe and everybody, we all work together that that whistle has a little role uh, in, in the scene musically. Um, and so that's my favorite one. Every time I hear that whistle blast, it's just, it, it makes me smile because I think of Jimmy, I think of the history of Mickey and, uh, and, and I can just feel the love of that, you know? I remember we talking, thinking about that last scene, you know, when you're working on a ride, there's always things changing, you know, we have a little bit less clearance here. We have to get this done in half a second less or more, you know, we have, and, and, and Kevin would always say, we've got to save that whistle. Go, go, whatever we do, go, Goofy's still got to go do do in that exact moment in the song. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's our pivot point. That's the one thing that's unchanging. I have to say, um, I agree with Kevin. I think the whistle is one of my favorites, but also, you know, Imagineering itself has this tremendous history. And there's a few nods to like our, our, our street location. Um, if you know where to look, you can find, uh, there's a 1401 flower shop <laughs> where we, where we yeah. all work. And so that's, it just, it was a lot of fun to put just little, just little gems in there uh, for our guests to discover. And by the way, and by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to say not real close to the 1401 flower shop. And, you know, our, our dear producer, Sharita, is a um, is a, a, an amazing, amazing, brilliant photographer. And so just down the street, if you look close enough, you can see Carter's cameras. <laughs> Little shop. That's amazing. <laughs> There's a couple of musical ones. Um, you'll, so I was talking about the old rides and in keeping with the old rides, I wanted the melody of the song to be to be in every scene of the ride you don't hear the words but you hear the the orchestra or the band mm -hmm. playing it um and we did do that there's one um uh uh well it's like there's wonderful things in in uh, haunted mansion that a lot of it's, a lot of people don't perhaps realize that you're hearing a very very simple skeletal version of the song when you're when you're in those early stages of the ride just hearing this this really really spooky organ the organ is actually already just sort of outlining the song that you're going to hear kind of in about 20 minutes time these amazing things from that first generation that i think is so great so we were trying to try trying to to to, to pay tribute to those kinds of things um uh, but there's one that you'll never hear i don't think because it's in the tornado scene and it's the um, the tornado is very loud so so the the the, the actual sound of the tornado but, but um the bass line of the orchestra that you actually can't even hear is playing the melody of nothing can stop us now. Um, uh, uh, you know, nobody knows except God. God knows that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and there's one other, which is that we have quite a few of the musicians in, in, the, in the ride um, not only worked on the shorts, but also have worked uh, at Disneyland. Um, uh, you have the 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 Dapper Dans come by uh, in the park scene, and and we wanted one of our Dapper Dans to be a real Dapper Dan so that he could 
advise and he could sort of you know uh give his seal of approval so so one of the one of the four dapper dance is actually a real dapper dance and everything that's being described is why this has been considered an instant classic attraction i absolutely agree um have you guys had a chance i mean i, I assume most of you have been on the attraction once it was completed but have you also had a chance to go back now that walt disney world is open again i'm going on thursday <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited about it. Well, actually, we, you know, all of us have been on the attraction many, many times before uh, opening, you know, for, for directing and, and different things like that and pulling all the elements together. Um, our, our biggest mission was we wanted people to be happy from the moment they step in the front door to the moment they exit. And, uh, and it just, you know, it, it, it can't help but make you smile. And Chris's music is just the icing of the cake on all that as well. And, and by the way, I just want to say one quick thing that Paul doesn't even know when you were talking about Little Hidden Mickeys. I just want to throw something out there that in the big city scene as well, if you look really, really closely, you can see oh, a little yeah. poster that says, Rudish for mayor. For mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed that one. <laughs> you have to write it again. <laughs> oh, darn. Okay. I get it. So now that this attraction is complete, do you think that we will see more Mickey and Friends attractions in the future? Like on the animation side, are you guys itching to write another new original short for something in the future? Or, or what can we as, as Parks fans and animation fans look forward to in the future now that this has made history as the first? Uh, I mean, from our side, I'd be happy to get involved with more Parks fun. Um, just again, from our angle, I, there's, we often do nods to the parks and park attractions or, you know, theme a cartoon that feels like, hmm, that could take place in Frontierland. Hmm, maybe that one takes place in Tomorrowland. So we, we've already kind of been working, doing this in reverse, like <laughs> kissing up parks in yeah. the park and, you know, showing our, our fandom that way. And uh, yeah, there's that will probably continue in our shorts because that's just part of the fun of, of Disney isms that we like to draw from. And again, if there's any other ways we can contribute to actual things in the parks, we've had a great time doing it. So, and you're really good at it too. <laughs> hey, and Sarah, I just wanted to add a, a second part to the, the answer to that question is that we are, you know, we first kind of embarked on this project. It was, it was daunting, it was exciting, it was challenging, it was scary because it was Mickey Minnie's first ever ride through attraction. And when we found out that Disneyland is going to have Mickey Minnie's Runaway Railway, uh, it's gonna to come to Disneyland in 2023, Mickey kind of comes full circle back to Disneyland. Um, we, we were just, we were, Sharita and I, I remember we heard the news, we were doing a little happy dance. <laughs> because um, you know, Mickey's coming home to Disneyland as well. And, um, and that uh, it's gonna be um, just as fun. It's gonna be there, we're, we're looking forward to it. It's gonna be just right here in my backyard. At Disneyland in Toontown, it's gonna be in the El Capitoon. <laughs> that is so perfect. <laughs> I am so excited for it to come to Toontown. It's going to be so exciting. 2023 can't come soon enough, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's all the time we have for today. But I hope everyone watching gets a chance to visit this one-of-a-kind and not to mention history-making attraction at Walt Disney World. And I'll be on the lookout for more to come soon. Thank you guys so much for being here with me today. It was so much fun. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Fun. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.